So Mark 14, uh, it tells us a, a timing marker. It begins in verse 1. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we're now in the last week of Jesus' life. We're coming up to um, his crucifixion. And that, that, that being the timing, it says, verse 1, the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. So they knew there wasn't anything worthy of death that had been done by him. He hadn't committed any real crimes. All he'd done is go around doing good. The, the only crime uh, that he'd committed was he offended them. And the way he offended them, well, they should be offended. There's wickedness in the heart of man, and when God exposes it, sometimes your response isn't always the best response, right? Sometimes you're mad at the person uh, you know, you think of some of these people confronted in the Old Testament kings because they have that authority. They get confronted, and what happens to the prophet who confronted them? He might get killed. He, you know, gets thrown in prison. And, but what he said was very helpful. It would save you from death, but you don't want to hear it. You know, you slam the door on him. You throw him in jail. So uh, here they are trying to trap Jesus. They can't find any legitimate reason, so they're going to try to do it by stealth. And then verse 2 Notice what they said. They're, they're committed to one thing in particular, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar of the people. Not on Passover, though. Let's get him, but let's get him one of these other days. They're here. You know, he's creating, there's this tension and there's this potential. So let's get him, but not on Passover. Now let me ask you a question. What day did Jesus die? Passover. So interesting that here they are, thinking they're working out their own plan. Why did Jesus die on Passover? Well, that's when the lamb is being sacrificed, that the blood is applied, so that the reminder of the angel of death passing over, you're saved from death by the blood of the lamb. It's not possible for Jesus to die on any other day. <laughs> He's not dying on the day of Pentecost because that's about a harvest. What happens on the day of Pentecost? Well, that's when the church begins. That's when there's a great harvest. 3,000 people get saved. Jesus isn't dying on that day. So you have here mixed the free will of man, and even in the wickedness of man, man's own heart devising a wicked plan, but God's going to overrule all of it. And they're determined, we're going to get him, and we're not going to do it on the Passover. And we say, well, actually, he's going to give up his life. He's going to give up his life on the day that he decided. And while you're, you're going to be a means to this, you really, um, and you're responsible for your own, your own choices, and the judgment will be upon you for those choices, Yet God's going to overrule all of that. Jesus is going to die on the day that he decided. It's awesome about our Lord. Sometimes we're, we're in similar situations where we're suffering the consequences of somebody else's stealth or somebody else's trickery or somebody else's wickedness. And then now you're reaping all the junk from that terrible decision. But you have to remember, God is always going to be in control. He'll always make things happen according to his timetable. Even if the other people have decided this will not happen on this on this particular day but when God says hey this is what's happening this is how it's going to happen and even their wickedness will turn into God's plan so verse three we have uh, one of these events from the last week of his life being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper he sat at the table and a woman having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard she broke the flask and she poured it on his head and there were some who were indignant among themselves and they said why was this fragrant oil wasted? It might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. Now, I don't know if anybody here has any perfume this expensive. A denarii would be a day's wage. So almost a whole year's worth of a laboring man's wages, 300 days' wages of a laboring man to buy this one flask, this one box. For, and it's, it's a one-time use. It doesn't have a little lid where you take a little bit off and you know, or like a junior high kid, you know, if a little's good, then infinity's better, you know. You ever had, you know, you guys that only have girls, look at the cupolas, you only have girls, you, you're going to miss out. <laughs> Nothing like a boy when he first discovers cologne. You're like, whoa, the whole neighborhood discovers it, you know. <laughs> the astronauts in space orbiting the planet discover, like, whoa, junior high kid, someone got him some cologne, <laughs> you know. Uh, this, is, this isn't like that. It's a one. It's a one-time deal. It's in this sealed box, and it was used for burial. It would be kind of a thing culturally that that uh, just part of that process of grieving, and it would just be very, very, very beautiful fragrance, very powerful, 
um, wonderful, and it, was, and it was just a one-time thing. And so she's taken something that probably you'd save up your whole life for and would be for yourself, and she's now taken it, and she's poured it out on Jesus. And then there's this indignance, though, among some of the disciples. We know that ultimately it began with Judas Iscariot. John will tell us that detail, but here they are saying this is a waste. Isn't it tragic that, that here are disciples of Jesus seeing someone love Jesus and the disciples of Jesus are crit criticizing it. Can I just give you a heads up, and hopefully you don't get it. Hopefully our church grows out of something like this, you know. But you're going to find when you decide in your passion a zeal for the Lord or just I'm going to make a sacrifice, you're going to find tragically that most of the time the opposition, the direct opposition you get to great acts of, of sacrifice come from other believers. And they'll... they'll, they'll They'll not see the reasonableness of your sacrifice. Well, you know, don't you need to think about yourself? Like, really? Yeah, what Bible verse were you referring to when you said that? You know, just interesting. Why this waste? Here's one of the most passionate expressions of love towards Jesus. And then amongst the disciples, these are going to become the apostles. The thought process hasn't really been transformed yet by the work of the Spirit, where that's a waste. You know, we could have used this for something else. Really? This is for Jesus. And look at his response. He defends her. Verse 6, he says, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She's done a good work for me. That's a good question. Why are you troubling her? Why so preoccupied with what someone else is doing? Why so preoccupied with somebody else's ministry? Why is it that you're so worried about how the person's driving in the lane next to you while you're driving on the bumps in your own lane? <laughs> Just a, sort of a human nature thing to be looking over there at this person, looking at that person. I can't believe these guys are doing this. And Jesus said, you know, why are you troubling her? She's done a good work for me. You have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good, but me you do not have always. There was a unique opportunity to express love towards Jesus himself, and she took that opportunity. And th that window of opportunity was very narrow. And so she recognized, hey, I've got a window of opportunity. She went for it. That's a, that's a wise person. So Jesus said, the opportunity to minister to the poor, that's a broad opportunity. Your whole life, you're going to be able to minister to the poor. Listen, today, if you, if you read this and you think, well, I really care about the poor, you can help the poor today. There's not a day that's going to go by. You can't find a poor person and go, you know what? God put it on my heart. I went over to Macy's, and there was a big men's sale, and I, you know, I know that you guys, are, and I just bought you know, two big bags of stuff you know, for you and the kids and whatever. You can help the poor anytime you want. You can find, you know, drive through a neighborhood and just knock on the door and, with your checkbook and go, what's your utility bill today? You know, hey, what's your, and just go down the street and help the poor. So the, the poor, the, oppor the opportunity to help the poor is a wide window. But there are other ministry opportunities in our life that have a real narrow window. You know, the, the shelf life, the expiration date. It's not like it's a Twinkie where... You know, I remember when the, you remember just not long ago, Hostess went out of business and they were worried about the Twinkies. And I thought, there's, the Twinkie will never go bad. Any Twinkies we have, you could eat this Twinkie 100 years from now, it'll be the same as a fresh Twinkie. There's nothing in it organic. It can't go bad. Leave it, leave it without the package on the shelf. It, it won't, you know, it'll eat it six weeks later. Not pretty similar to, you know, right out of the box. Some things have a long shelf life, great opportunity. You know, you look at some of the food maybe in your closet and you look at the expiration date and you maybe want to think twice about buying it. Go, it's not bad till 10 years or a year from now. A year from now, this cereal goes bad. Huh, I wonder what's in it. <laughs> Other things you buy from the store and you know, hey, you gotta, we got to go through this stuff quick. Why? Well, it's going to go bad. So you have some opportunities that the, the, the window is just narrow. So Jesus is saying she recognized that she could do something for me. Now, how, how long is this window open? Well, we just read in verse 1, it's just two days, and then it's the Passover. If you're going to do something for Jesus while he's alive on the earth to show him before his cross that you love him and that you're, you're tracking with him, you've got, you got this little window. Go for it. So there's a great principle here about using your opportunity. Can you recognize the opportunities you have? You have some, like with the poor, they're very wide. You have other opportunities. I may only meet this person one time. I may, I may only get to talk to this person this one time. I've got this little narrow window. So recognize, re recognizing it, she did. 
She did what she could, verse 8, like the woman uh, with the uh, two mites that we looked at um, just a couple weeks ago. She did what she could. She didn't do what she couldn't do. She did what she could. She took what she had. What do I have? I've got to... I've got to show Jesus my love. And so she took what she had, very costly. She's come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. And assuredly, I say to you that wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. So Jesus thought it was so important. He wanted everybody to know about it. So 2,000 years later, on the other side of the earth, until I come in a totally different language, a bunch of idol, idol worshipers who got saved will be gathered hearing her story. And when she did it on that day, Jesus is knowing that so far, all around the planet, you can go, you can tell her story. You can meet anybody anywhere and go, you know, it's so great that you've met Jesus. Let me tell you about this woman who knew Jesus and what she did. It's part of, of, part of his uh, commitment to her is uh, remembering what she did. And then verse 10, the stealth, here's what happens. Satan works this all out. Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priest to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad, and they promised to give him money, and so he sought how he might conveniently betray him. It's one of the tragic and hard-to-understand parts of the ministry of Jesus. Judas, how could you be so close to Jesus and then do this? You come coming to him and say, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll sell him out to you. I know, I know his movements. They don't want to deal with Jesus publicly because the crowds are so caught up in what's happening so they can't just march down into the temple court and grab him by force because they'd have a riot and they'd be killed by the people. So they got to get Jesus when he's away. But Jesus isn't staying in the same place all the time. He's, you know, we see him at Bethany, like in the last little stories in Bethany. He's on the Mount of Olives. He's in different places around that week. He goes out of the city every night. And so Judas said, I can, I can deliver him. And so they say, okay, we'll give you some money. They agree on this amount. And then now we come to the night before he's crucified, verse 12. That's the first day of unleavened bread. When they killed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that you may eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and he said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. Wherever he goes in, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And then he'll show you a large upper room furnished and prepared and there make ready for us. Some of you have a, a smartphone that has a GPS or a map. You know, you have, a, you have your Google Maps or whatever you have in your car. You have a GPS system. Jesus GPS, JPS, <laughs> is way better. Seriously. The timing of all of this. Jesus tells the guys, just go into the town, and you'll find a guy carrying a pitcher of water. Number one, that's remarkable, because who carries water? The women carry water. So you'd immediately want to say, no, you have this wrong, Lord, right? There's going to be a man carrying water? That's, that doesn't make any sense. You just have to listen to Jesus and do what he says, because he knows everything. So just go into the town. You'll see a guy carrying a pitcher of water. Make eye contact, but don't let him realize it, and then follow him. So just wherever he goes, you'll see him, and then follow him wherever he goes. Whatever house he enters into, then, then go to that house and say, the master needs the room, is it ready? And the guy will say, yeah, sure, and he'll, it's, all, it's all prepared. Super interesting, isn't it? Now, there's a lot of different ways Jesus could have done the thing that he did. He did this in this way to teach the disciples something. What do they need to learn? They need to learn that he knows what's happening. They're going to have to learn to walk by faith, not by sight. One of, the, one of the lessons that Jesus is continually uh, provoking in our lives is he's pulling us out of that, that lifestyle where we want to have everything figured out and everything under control, and he's pulling us out of that into the life of, just trust me, and I'll tell you what's coming next. And you say, okay, well, then what's coming next, and then I'll trust you. And he'll say, no, trust me, and then I'll tell you what's coming next. And you say, great, I'm all for that. Tell me what's coming next, and I'll trust you. And then you kind of have this conversation, and then you lose right? I mean, he doesn't, he, he, the only way for you to learn how to walk by faith is to walk by faith. So he'll tell you something, he'll tell you something that doesn't make sense. Go, go into the town, you'll see a guy carrying water. 
And if you're one of the people that wants to have everything dialed in, everything, well, wait a minute, Lord, really, I'm going to find a guy, you could just think of all the objections to this. What if I find the wrong guy? What if I go to the wrong house and the guy looks at me like I'm crazy? The master needs to use your house. Imagine if God told you something like that today, like go to the 76 station and you'll see a man with a water jug. He'll be coming out of the 76 station. Follow him to his house and tell him that's where we're having the uh, Sunday service. You'd say, what? Well, it's that. It's crazy. So I have to just trust the Lord that he knows what he's saying. I just need to learn how to... I just need to learn to listen to Jesus and do what he says. So, so important. So they do it. And we know from uh, Luke's gospel, guess who these two guys are? It's Peter and John. So they're in sort of the, the remedial class. They're, they're getting all these extra, they're repeating the grade, so to speak. You know, They've been in kindergarten the whole time, and they're still in kindergarten. And here's your carpet square. It's nap time. Don't touch your neighbor. Peter, don't touch him. John, James, sons of thunder, stay on your carpet square. They're always separated from everybody else. He, whenever he's going to do something, they have to go with him. Can't leave them alone with the other guys. It's, I don't think it's like a privilege. I think it's you three with me. The rest of you guys have caused enough trouble on your own. I can't leave these guys uh, with you. So they, they're getting this extra lesson on trusting the Lord. So, of course, verse 16, you know, it's always easier to read about it in someone else's life. So the disciples went out and came into the city and noticed they found it just as he had said to them. You know, you read through it in a few verses, and you say, well, of course, hey, just like the Lord said, they did it. But when you're living through this thing in your own life, that this, these verses seem a lot longer, don't they? It's a three-month trial. It's a six-month thing. It's a five-year thing. It's a 10-year, and you, it seems like eternity while you're just believing what God said and moving forward by faith, not understanding. But it'll always be the same. It'll be just as Jesus said. So then at the table, they're in the evening, so the, the official day of Passover begins when sun sets. So now sun is set, so it's Passover. So it's, they're taking the meal. He's with the 12, and at verse 18, they sat there and eat, ate, and Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you who eats with me will betray me. And all of them, at this moment, really doubted themselves. One of the few times they demonstrated some self-awareness and humility when they all are, are not sure of themselves, they all say, is it I? It's very interesting. At this point in their relationship with the Lord, they're not, there's no, there will be in a moment with Peter in particular, but as he says, one of you will betray me, and they all look in their hearts, and they think, you know what, I could do it. Like, is it me? I hope, it, like, please say it's not me. I don't want to be the, but in their own hearts, they've lost, you know, like, that could be me. And I think we all um, praise the Lord that, that he's our savior. So is it I? Is it I? And, and then he said this, verse 20, it's one of the 12 who dips with me in the dish. They're sharing a meal together. They're all eating out of the same communal bowls, sitting around a low table with shared bowls of food, and everybody gets a piece of bread, and you tear off the bread, and you all dip in the same bowl, and you double dip, and you triple dip, and you're biting your bread, and you're dipping, and you're talking to that guy, and he's and he's dipping, and, and you're one. Literally, I mean, you've become one. Everybody's got everybody else's saliva and germs and all of that. I mean, it's, it's a cultural thing. If you ever get a chance to sit at a table like this, it's very, you know, we've become, you know, so we're the Purell nation, you know, like, oh, I'll take another bite. You know? We, we ate, uh, in Malaysia, we ate at these, this Muslim family's house. Uh, one of our friends had this relationship that he's built with his family and had all the guys, young guys from the church at the time, and uh, uh, had a communal meal like that, and uh, eating with our hands, no utensils. And so some of the, some of the soup and the, and the sauces, you just ate with your bare hands. So I'm looking at these guys, they're digging in with their bare hands, and everyone takes the first bite, and it's okay. Then everyone looks at their hand, they've just... You know, and then, like, second bite is the hard one. <laughs> you know, looking at Chad, and everyone's like, do we do, and like, the family's right there with us, and they're like, all right, guys, just go, close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, the intimacy of that meal, the intimacy of someone who I would share a meal with that I become one with is my betrayer. The openness of Jesus. 
When you open yourself up like this, then you're vulnerable, aren't you? You're vulnerable to be betrayed. And you've been betrayed, haven't you? You felt the sting of somebody stabbing you in the back. You felt the, uh, the Im- amazing disappointment when someone you completely trusted in totally bailed on you. We've all felt it. And, and that, that searing, it's just a searing pain. And sometimes it takes years to even sort of be able to sort of talk about it. And it's just there. Sometimes you almost feel like, I don't know that this wound will ever really totally heal. And, and Jesus knows it. One of the things about coming to our great high priest is there's not an experience that you and I will have uh, that he can't be a high priest who sympathizes with us. He knows it. So he said, the Son of Man goes as it was written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he'd never been born. So the consequences will come. And then the Lord's Supper, the institution of communion, verse 22 As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, take and eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. He said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So a very simple ceremony that was instituted by Jesus. The early church um, continued on in um, eating the broken bread, drinking the cup, remembering Jesus. Um, We don't really have very many religious institutions established by Jesus. We have water baptism and we have communion. And there really isn't anything else. Uh, The early church was a very simple gathering. Uh, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. It wasn't, it wasn't what we would consider today a high church. It wasn't a very formal church. The early church met in homes, or they met publicly in Solomon's porch when they gathered together the thousands of people to hear the apostles teach, and from house to house. Very informal gatherings. There wasn't a class of people who were you know, the, the ones that really know everything and everybody else you know, is dominated by them. That, those, the church structures and the church hierarchy and the high church and all these all the pomp and circumstance, ceremony that developed, that all come, came out of the heart of man. What Jesus gave us was the simplest thing. The poorest person on the planet can put together a communion service. Unleavened bread. That's like my grandma's biscuits that she used to make. Unleavened bread, baby, hockey puck style. Uh, I love her, but uh, her idea of a biscuit is not like a, my idea of what a biscuit should be like. But it was, you know, it's because she's from... Uh, you know, poverty, really, you know, the lifestyle, like where we know when she was young, when she was first married, they lived in the hills in eastern Kentucky, you know, my dad, I think, was the first of the, of the, uh, she had 16 pregnancies and nine surviving children, lost seven babies, Um, my dad's the first one, and he's the middle, he's the, he's the uh, fourth son, Uh, got one older sister, and four, so he's the sixth that, that survived, first one born in a hospital, you know, living in a, in a time, if just a very simple life, um, you know, her idea, you know, the meal, you just, you don't need a lot to get together some, something that will put some food in your stomach. And so you think of the communion, what is it? It's unleavened bread. It's just some flour. You don't even need leaven. <laughs> it's just, it, essentially, we call that a cracker. It's a cracker, and then it's a cup of, it's a cup of juice. It's a, it's a cup of wine. It's just the simplest thing. Anybody could get that. You could be the poorest person in the church. You could still have people at your house and have communion, couldn't you? You maybe couldn't serve them filet mignon, or you, know, you, couldn't, you maybe couldn't afford to go to this particular restaurant. You can have any, anybody, no matter how poor they are, could have people over and have communion. Hey, come over to my house. We're going to break bread. I went and got some Ritz you know, from the food closet. Anybody can provide this. A very simple, simple thing. And it's all about Jesus. It's not about the meal. It's not about the ceremony. It's about the person that the ceremony is pointing you to. And that's how it always is with Jesus. And that's not to say that you can't have ceremony as long as your ceremony becomes about Jesus. But what happens with ceremony is ceremony becomes an end unto itself. People want the ceremony. And they're not so interested in the person that the ceremony is pointed to. That's what happened in the first century even. Then verse 26, they sang. I've always loved this verse. When they'd sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. 
There's a group of psalms that it's believed uh, were probably sung at this time, the Songs of Ascent, um, about this you know, approach for worship in Jerusalem. Can you imagine Jesus and the twelve going out just singing? What was his voice like? What if he sounded like me? You know? Remember the Bible says there's no form nor comeliness that we should, you know, don't think of Pavarotti, Jesus out there, you know, drawing attention to himself. What, you know, there's not, there's not really anything like a bunch of guys that love the Lord and then they, they're singing together. Um, so off they go, singing a song, going out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus now begins to minister to them about what they're going to face and, and it unfolds as we go through the rest of the chapter. And we're going to pay particular attention. Mark focuses on Peter. And that's important because most people believe that Mark's um, account here uh, of the life of Jesus is Peter's perspective, Peter's account. Luke says, I, I went and I researched it. And John tells us, hey, I'm an eyewitness. So John's gospel, hey, this is me. Matthew was one of the 12. Matthew's gospel is, hey, this is me. Luke was a Gentile, later on a companion of Paul. He says at the beginning of his gospel, I went around and talked to people. They were all still alive. He, when he was with Paul, when they're in Jerusalem, he goes around and he finds, hey, you know, Zacharias, John the Baptist's parents, or, you know, or, or some relative. Or, he's got a lot of backstory on a lot of this stuff because he went at it sort of as a journalistic researcher. Mark, it's believed, Mark is telling Peter's account that Mark had spent time with Peter later on and that this account is sort of Peter's eyewitness account, Mark recording it. And so it's interesting if that's true, and most people sort of, it's kind of a common, commonly accepted um, assumption, then it's interesting from here to the end of chapter 14 because the focus is on Peter. Of all the of all, you know, of all these events of the, this is just a very concise, uh, and you can, all, it's very easy to just sort of make an analysis of what happened to him, and the steps that lead from a guy who says, I will never deny you, and within a few hours is denying him. How does a person do that? How do you make that journey from, in your own spirit or your own heart, you say, I will never, ever deny Jesus. I don't care if they kill me, I will never deny him, and then about you know, 10 hours later, you've denied him three times. How do you do that? How does that happen? And uh, we get a very uh, concise look at it, and I think it's really most likely that this is Peter's account, and so he sort of uh, is humbling himself and having this story told this way. So Jesus makes this statement in verse 27, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. So Jesus said it. This is going to happen. All of you will stumble. Then number two, he quotes the Old Testament. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. So God said that. God said that when his shepherd comes, and remember, who's the good shepherd? What does Psalm 23 say? The Lord is my shepherd. Who's the shepherd of Israel? Well, you say David, the son of David, the Messiah, but ultimately it's Jehovah. It's God. It's the name of God, Yahweh. I am. I'm your shepherd, and now, now we have God, the great I am, saying, I'm going to smite the shepherd. It's a picture of the, uh, the Trinity, that unique nature uh, that we understand from the Bible of, of God, that he's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. There's some distinction, the three, but there's only one God. The three are one, and it's a mystery. Great is the mystery of godliness. So the Lord saying, I will smite the shepherd, and God said the sheep will be scattered. So Jesus said, you're all going to bail, and... Not only am I telling you, but God said it was going to happen. Now, gives them the hope, verse 28, after I've been raised, I'll go before you to Galilee. Now watch Peter's response to the word of God and to the word of Jesus. Verse 29, Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not. Really? Jesus just said this is going to happen. Yeah, but Jesus doesn't know me. I'm the exception. Here is... Uh, a very, very important lesson to learn for all of us, myself, for you, every single one of us, we are not an exception to what the Bible says. So many terrible decisions get made when someone says, I know the Bible says this, but I'm the exception. That doesn't apply to me. I know God says this should be the way it is, but 
Whenever you find yourself accepting yourself from what God said, God says this, but then you know you're on your way. We're going to watch Peter go from, I, it's just so sure, so strong, to denying the Lord. Well, here's, here's the first step. Think of yourself as an exception. The Bible says don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, right? It's pretty clear. I mean, it couldn't be clearer. How many times when someone gets yoked together with an unbeliever and you say, hey, man, you need to, you need to be careful about, hey, don't put that on me. Hey, I'm the exception. Really, you are. You're the one person that that Bible verse doesn't apply to. Wow, well, that's good. It's nice to meet you. What other ones don't apply to you? How many times? Have no idols. Well, that, this is a little idol. It's like a rabbit's foot. You know, it's just a small little furry thing. It's not a big deal. I'm the exception. This doesn't really apply. The Bible says it so clearly, but you know what? I'm not going to apply the Bible to my life. Whenever, there's, whenever God's word comes directly to you, you want to receive it. Whenever you find yourself accepting yourself from obedience, you know you're on the pathway that leads to saying and doing things you never dreamed that you thought you'd ever say or do. I don't think Peter ever... His, I think his conscience and his heart is, I cannot imagine that this would happen. Well, you better imagine it, bro, because <laughs> it's about to happen to you. And the fact that you won't receive what God says, you're putting yourself in a place of being vulnerable. When God speaks to you about something, the best thing to do is say, oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> Lord, give me strength. Lord, change my heart. Lord, my heart's hard right now. Even as you're telling me this, I don't really like what you're saying, so change my heart. Just humble yourself to whatever degree you can humble yourself and then keep humbling yourself and pray for God to help you humble yourself more. But you're in deep trouble when God speaks and you say, that doesn't apply to me. You're going down the wrong road. So, Jesus tells him straight up, verse 30, particularly him, he says, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. So this is going to happen. God's word said this is going to happen. It's not going to happen. Actually, it is going to happen. In fact, you're going to do it in the most pronounced way of anybody. When we think of, when we, think of, when we say the word, you guys know the Bible, if I say, who denied Jesus? Who's famous for denying Jesus? Everybody would know. They would, you'd all say Peter. But guess who else denied Jesus that night? <laughs> well, all of them. But they're not famous for it. Guess who got famous for that? The guy who said, I'm the exception. So if you don't want to get famous, <laughs> if you don't want to get famous for doing the wrong thing, if you don't want to become the preeminent example of, hey, don't do this. Don't make yourself the exception. Let the word of God come to you. When it comes to you, like a steamroller, lay down and get steamrolled. Just humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So he doesn't listen to that, verse 31. And this is how you always should respond when Jesus corrects you. That was a joke. That was sarcasm. He spoke more vehemently. If I have to die with you, I won't deny you. And everyone else said, yeah, yeah, man, what he said. If I have to die with you. No, this is going to happen. No. Can you imagine? Actually, tragically, I can't imagine. I've done this, and God help me. We want to walk with the Lord and not argue with him. Your word is wrong. I'm right. My wife is wrong. She's a problem. Judge her. I'm going to walk back in that room, and you better judge her before I get there. <laughs> Aren't we awesome? So great. Good thing we have a great Savior because we're greatly and tragically lost. So if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. It's like, well, he'll get filled with the Spirit. He will die for Jesus later. God works in his life. Thank God for Peter. What an example. What an encouragement. But at this point, it's a warning. Don't, don't do this. Then the next step, they go out into the garden where they were uh, spending the, the, the night. Gethsemane is its name. And so he said to the disciples, sit here while I pray. And then he took Peter, James, and John with him. So the, the nine, or Judas is gone, so there's the eight. And he said, you guys wait here. And Peter and James and John, come with me. And he separates them, and he wants them to be with him while he's praying. And he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. And he said to them in verse 34, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. 
So they're told two things. Stay right here. He's going to separate now himself alone from them, just a little ways away. But he wants them to be close enough they can hear what he's saying. They're with him, but not exactly with him. He separated them. I, I want you to stay here. And what's the other command? Watch. What does that mean? Stay awake. He, it's going to be clear through the context that that is obviously prayer also. I'm going through something. I need you to watch with me. Something's going on. We need to pray. I need you guys to pray with me. So watch. Stay here and watch. And he goes and he begins to enter into the cross. It's the beginning of the cross. This is where the passion of Christ begins in the garden. This is where the suffering begins. This is where it's settled in prayer. Before, long before he's hung on the cross, the battle and the victory is won here in this garden in prayer. So he went a little further, verse 35, and he fell on the ground, and he prayed if it were possible this hour might pass from him. He prayed, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Now, notice he comes back to Peter and the others. Look at verse 37. He came and he found them sleeping. He told them, I want you to watch with me. Just the one command, not the Ten Commandments. Just the one commandment. Stay here and stay awake. And he comes back and they're asleep. They're not watching with him. They're not praying. He says, finding them asleep, he says to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Look at this question. Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. If your spirit's willing and your flesh is weak, what should you be doing? You need to pray. You know, guys, that's why we started meeting on Wednesday mornings and Friday mornings praying. You know why? Because we got a weak flesh. The spirit's willing. The problem is our flesh is so weak. We have to pray. Couldn't you watch one hour? So here he's being called to prayer. There's a call from Jesus for, to pray, and, and they're not participating. They're sleeping. So here's the next step. He says, the word of God is not applying to me. The next step is he's sleeping when he should be praying. When you let prayer slip out of your life, when, you, when prayer is not part of your, your experience with the Lord, you're going you're gonna to find yourself easy pickings for the enemy. You're on a road going to a, an off-ramp that's getting off in the wrong neighborhood. <laughs> you're going down a dead-end street. You're not going somewhere where you're going to be successful. You're going somewhere where you're going to get hammered. That's one of the reasons why we haven't even come to, you know, I've had people ask me since we started praying for the, hey, when are we going to do some men's thing? Like, we're doing the men's thing. <laughs> we're praying. We have to watch and pray. Our spirit's willing. Our flesh is weak. We have to pray. Jesus has called us to pray. We can't sleep. We've got to pray. We have to make it a priority. That's why we took aside that time last week, Monday through Friday. You know why? We have to seek the Lord. We have to hear from God. We've got to seek Him. We've got to hear from Him. We've got to wait upon Him. We've got to open our hearts to Him. We've got to pour out our heart before Him. We've got to seek the Lord. Something's happening. Jesus is doing something. We have to be in communion with Him. So when Jesus calls to pray, you need to pray. Now, you say, well, my spirit's willing. Great. So was Peter's at this point. How'd that work out for him? <laughs> hey, a willing spirit's a good thing. But when you got a willing spirit and you got a flesh that dominates, guess what you have? You're going to, in a short time, be denying Jesus. You're going to be in the wrong place doing the wrong thing with a willing spirit. How many people with a willing spirit are continually in the wrong place doing the wrong thing? That's not God's plan for your life. That's not... These guys all deny it. When, when Jesus said it's going to happen and when God prophesied it in Zechariah that the sheep will be scattered, that's not because that's how God wants it. That's just how it is. When someone says, I'm an exception to, to what God says, that doesn't apply to me. And when they say, uh, I'm not going to pray when God's calling them to pray, well, that's what happens. So watch and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. You want the victory? Then you need to start praying. So verse 39, he separated again. They woke up probably for a few minutes. They had heavy eyes. He went away and he prayed and he spoke the same words. And when he came back, he found them asleep again. There it is. Their eyes were heavy. Have you ever had heavy eyes? You know the disease. You know what they're struggling with. You just can't keep your eyes open. And uh, their eyes are heavy and they didn't know what to answer him. And then he says in verse 41, the third time, are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Well, your chance to pray, 
that window of opportunity, it just closed. So when I pulled you guys aside because you were going to need to pray because what's about to happen, you had this window to pray, that window closed. The mob is there, and they're out of sorts. Everybody's been asleep. They haven't been being prepared spiritually for what's about to unfold. And so as it unfolds, they're lost. There's no spiritual vitality. There's no strength. Are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. And now his betrayer had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he's the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. So in the dark, on the side of the hill, trees around, you know, guys running around, you know, Judas says, I'll, I'll point him out, I'll go up, it's the guy that I greet with a kiss, that's the one, that's the one you want to get. So he comes to Jesus, verse 45, <clears throat> went up to him and said, Rabbi, Rabbi, and kissed him, and then they grabbed Jesus, they laid hands on him, they took him. In verse 47, one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. You know who that was. Would have been way better to be praying instead of being Zorro. All of a sudden now, he's valiant. There's a bravery, but it's a, what we would call bravado. This isn't courage from the Holy Spirit. It's interesting how you can be doing something and say, the Lord told me to do this. Really? Did God tell you to take out your sword and cut that guy's head off? I don't think he told you to do that. Jesus tells him, put away the sword. So what's this thing in Peter's heart, a boldness? That's Peter's heart. Now, why is Peter's heart telling him to do something stupid? Peter's been sleeping when he's supposed to be praying. When you're not really walking in fellowship with the Lord or in communion with the Lord, you'll have all kinds of stuff that you'll think, man, this is the Lord. Well, is it? How can you know if you're not in fellowship with him? If you're saying the word of God doesn't apply to you and you don't pray, then how would you be able to discern that this is actually God telling you to do this? Bravado is what it is. It's just his flesh. Jesus rebukes the crowd, the mob there. Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? I was with you in the temple teaching, and you didn't seize me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. And then they all forsook him and fled. So what Jesus said happened, what God's word said happened, and there wasn't an exception. So now the reality, now it's unfolding. Peter, is it, the Bible doesn't apply to me. He's not walking in fellowship. In fact, he's, he's doing things saying, well, this is the Lord, but really it's his flesh. He's not able to distinguish that. They all run. Mark adds this one little uh, snippet of information, and most likely this is autobiographical. No one else includes this. But remember, later, the church is meeting at John Mark's mother's house when they're praying for Peter to be released. It would seem that maybe uh, one of the conjectures is that the Last Supper actually took place at John Mark's house, uh, Mark who wrote the gospel. So this little tidbit is added. Um, a certain young man followed him having a linen cloth thrown around his naked body, and the young man grabbed him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. So it would seem that Mark not being, this, who else would know this, that there's a streaker in the story? Probably not completely naked, but running in his chonies through the Mount of Olives back across the Kidron Valley into the city uh, in the night. So it's happening in the middle of the night. Um, what's believed to have happened is that the supper took place at Mark's house. He's kind of watching it unfold. They go out. He follows them, kind of wanting to be around where the guys are. Just took his bed sheet with him, you know, wrapped himself, and he's just wrapped. He's got his undergarments underneath, but not what you'd ever show yourself in public. And he's there, and everybody takes off running, and he's not really in the group, but he's there in the thing, and then some guys grab him. And, uh, and he lets them have his sheet, and whoo! It's a funny story. The Bible, when people say, I don't know the Bible, and you think, did you ever read it? There's a, there's a guy running around in his underwear on the Mount of Olives. That's an awesome story. Like, the Bible's not... If you were writing a, a book to try to make a fake religion, would you include something like this? I'd leave this out. If I'm trying to establish a religion and establish my credibility, I'd leave out the guy running around in his chonies. It's not really, it's not really holy. Like, we've had communion. We've, we've got all these guys failing. Peter's about to deny. I mean, you think, like, what a story. Who's the hero? It's Jesus. These guys, if they're setting themselves up to be the pope, 
and to rule over the people and become wealthy and have special titles and have a church hierarchy. They're telling the story the wrong way. You read the story and you say, these guys are exactly like us. I could have done something like that. I'm that kid who would have followed, you know, and would have been in the wrong, like, oh, no, they got me now. Ah! So Mark adds that detail. I think it's him. I, I kind of agree with the conjecture. Anyway, back to the real story. Verse 53, they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him uh, were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. And this is the next step in Peter's fall. But Peter followed him at a distance. Peter followed him at a distance. Or the old King James, I think, says, Peter followed from afar. Why has Peter got to keep a distance between him and Jesus? He doesn't want to be identified with Jesus. Now, whenever you find yourself in a place where you think, I can't be totally identified with Jesus, I, I don't want to not be following him. I'm going to follow him, but I'm not going to follow so close that anyone can tell. Then you're in trouble. You're, going to, you're going down a road that's going to lead to destruction. Peter followed from a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. He, here's the next step. He sat with the servants and he warmed himself at the fire. Being far away from Jesus, now you're in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. Think of this. Peter is warming himself at the enemy's fire. But whenever you say, the Bible doesn't apply to me, and you don't walk in fellowship with the Lord, you're not praying, you're sleeping when you should be praying, then you start following from afar, then you know what's going to happen next? You're going to find yourself with the enemies, doing what the enemies do to bring themselves comfort. People who don't know Jesus, they do things to get comfort, don't they? They drink. Alcohol brings them comfort. They have a long day. They go to the enemy's fire and they warm themselves, don't they? I'll just take a couple glasses of wine. I'll take a couple of beers, you know, maybe six. You know, it starts, you know, it's, it starts to get a hold of you. You just, you drink till your behavior changes. If you're drinking till your behavior changes, we call that drunkenness, Right? If your behavior changes, then now you're under the influence. If you drank something and it didn't change your behavior, then you've partaken in a way that you're not drunk. But if, if all of a sudden you're funnier than you normally are, or you're, you're more gregarious than you normally are, you're now under the influence. That's called being drunk. Now, what happens to people is they say, no, no, I, have, I know what drunk is. Well, if you're passed out on the front lawn and you don't have any idea who you are, well, that's drunkenness also. But once you come under the influence of alcohol, then you're drunk. You're a drunkard. But that's a fire that the enemy, you know, the enemies, they don't have a relationship with God. They don't have the peace of God. So they warm, they get high. They get stoned. They, you know, they light up every day. That's how they, that's their fire. They, they, they're finding solace. They find peace somewhere. So he, you can imagine Peter standing there where the enemies of Jesus get warmed and he's getting warm where they get warm. But here's what happens to you. You say the Bible doesn't apply to me. You're sleeping when you should be praying. You're, you're, you've got some still fleshly bravado. You are following from a distance. Well, pretty soon you'll be doing what the enemy's doing. You'll be in the wrong place doing the wrong thing. The wrong people, the wrong place, the wrong thing. And that's where now we find Peter. When you're there, guess what's coming next? It's just a matter of time. You're already... You're already in the snare. You're already trapped. So the chief priests, all the council, were, they're, they're trying to get Jesus to find some uh, witness against him so they can put him to death. They found none. Verse 56, they had false witnesses come, but as is always the case when people are lying, you can't, they can't keep their story straight. Some of them got up and said in verse 58, he said, I will destroy the temple made with hands, and with three days I'll build another made without hands. He didn't say that. Um, not even their testimony agreed. And the high priest stood up in the midst of everyone. Do you answer nothing? What is it that these men testify against you? But he kept silent. He didn't answer anything. Again, the high priest asked him and said, Are you the Christ, the Son of the blessed? Jesus said, I am. There's why they wanted to kill him. He, to them, that would be blasphemy. Because to be the son of God is to be God himself. That's a blasphemous statement. I am. Then he refers to Daniel 7, the one who's going to receive the kingdom, the son of man. You'll see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes, said, what further need do we have of witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him 
to be deserving to death. Then they began to uh, spit on him, verse 65. They blindfolded him. They began to beat him. They said to him, prophesy, and the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. So they immediately began to rough him up. They've already roughed him up a bit, grabbing him on the mountain, bringing him in. Now they've got him in this place at the high priest's house, an illegal gathering. It's against their law to have a trial uh, after dark. You have to wait till the sun's up. Isn't, is, doesn't that sound like a good idea? When they come to get you and it's after dark, that's bad. So that was against the law, what they're doing actually, even the trial itself. Now back to Peter, and we'll finish up the chapter, and we'll, we'll finally get Peter at the end of the road. Now verse 66, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and she said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth, but he denied it. He said, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he went out on the porch and a rooster crowed. That's a wake-up call, right? That's the alarm going off. And Peter's going to hit the snooze button. Remember, Jesus said before the rooster crows twice, you know, he's going to get sort of a a chance. Hey, man, you're on that road, dude. You're about to go through the bridge out sign. It's one more warning. I don't know him. I don't even know what you're talking about. And he walks outside like, I got to get away from these guys. Now, ah. And, and he's, his mind is all messed up because he's, he's far away from Jesus, not identified with Jesus, sleeping when he's supposed to be praying. The Bible doesn't apply to him. You have all that stuff going on in you, and then your brain gets all messed up. And he stands out there, and then the rooster crows. Peter, come on, man. We're rooting for him, aren't we? Like, no, we know it's happening. Every time I read this, I root for him. No, Peter, please. <laughs> I know where it's, where it's headed, but I root for him every time. He denied it. Verse 69, a servant girl saw him again. The servant girl saw him again, began to say to those, comes back inside. They go, she goes, he's one of them. I know it. Verse 70, he denied it again. Then a little later, those who stood by, they said to Peter, surely you're one of them. You're a Galilean. Your speech shows it. So they had regional dialects. Peter's from, he's from the hills. You know, he's from up north. He's from uh, a tiny little fishing village. Bethsaida is, is his hometown, which is a tiny little town. He's been fishing and living in Capernaum uh, with James and John, his friends, and his brother Andrew. That town never was more than 2,000 people. So he's not from a university town. He's not educated. He probably has what we would call maybe a fourth grade education, probably has some arithmetic, some reading and writing, you know, uh, can put his mark on a page to sign his name. He's not like, like Saul of Tarsus, a rabbi, you know, He's a fisherman, he's a manual labor guy, and he's from this regional area, this small towns. So he speaks in a certain way. Now he's in Jerusalem, he's in the big city, he's with all the hobnob guys, the, the top guys, and, and he, he can't say anything and not reveal where he's from. No, dude, like I'm totally not from SoCal. <laughs> like, yes, you are. <laughs> no, I came down here on the five. Yeah, yeah, you're from Southern California. I took the 405. No, I took, you know, we don't say the before the name of the highway. You're Southern Californian. We know. I came up on I-5. There's regional, we have, in California, we have regional dialects, right? Someone's from some place, you can tell immediately. Can't, sometimes it's kind of subtle, but you're like, hey, that guy's from this part of the country. They're from here. Sometimes it's not so subtle. Someone from Mississippi, right? We have, I think Brandon Smith, what a beautiful accent he has. He invited us over to his house for a barbecue. Just the way he said it, I just immediately felt something wonderful, a flavor. Like, I don't even know what it is you're talking about. The way you say it with that accent, barbecue and that accent, I'm coming. Regional dialect. Peter has one. You're a Galilean. What are you doing here? Why are you here in the court? You're in the courtyard of the high priest. You're a Galilean. you got to be with him. You're one of his guys. Then Peter says, so that they'll know, he began to curse and swear. He's making oaths. He's cursing. I don't want to condemn anybody, but you know, the cursing shouldn't really be part of you. If you're a follower of Jesus and you have to make oaths and you're cursing and you're speaking in a way, that, that's how unbelievers speak, right? If you're a believer in Jesus, speak like Jesus speaks. 
Don't speak like the world speaks. You don't need to, you don't need to be relevant to the world and speak the way that they speak. That, they're speaking like that because that's what's in their heart. But Jesus changes our hearts. And your heart changes and your speech changes. And I don't want to make a legalistic thing out of it, but they, they say, we can tell by how you talk. And so he said, okay, then I'll show you how I talk. I can talk just like one of you guys. And you'll know I'm not one of his disciples. So he begins to curse and swear, making these oaths. We know how the story ends. A second time, the rooster crowed. Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. And then this is where his life changes. Look at the next sentence. And when he thought about it, he wept. Up until this point, if you ask Peter, you say, Peter, who do you think is the greatest disciple? What would his answer be? It's me. We just spend some time with us. Spend a day with us. You'll realize it. I'm the guy. I mean, I'm the guy that's called the rock. You know, I, I made the great confession. Yeah, but didn't, didn't he call you Satan? Yeah, but that was a minor thing. Uh, you, know, he, you know, he's going to come around still. I'm pretty sure he's going to come around. Um, and, you know, I cut that dude's ear off. Did you see that? Like, I'm the only one. I went for it. I'm kind of a charger. I'm like, I'm a radical. At this moment, you think for the rest of his life, for the rest of his life, what will he say? What do you think he'll say? He'll say, I'm Peter, I denied Jesus. But, but Jesus saved me. He saved me from all my sins. He saved me from myself. So, you know, this story is just this amazing story. It's a perfect sort of case study on what not to do. Are you saying the word of God doesn't apply to you? You don't take it seriously. You don't, you don't read it. You don't try to find out what God's commands are, what his promises are, what his warnings are. Then, man, you're going down a road that's going to lead you to denying the Lord. And you say, I will never go down that road. You're on that road. It starts by saying, the word of God doesn't have a place in my life. Then what happens after that is you'll find yourself sleeping when you're supposed to be praying. Your spirit might be willing, but your flesh is weak. You need to pray. If you don't make time to pray, you're already on that road. And you say, I'm not on that road. You are. If you don't pray, you're on that road. What will happen then is you start following from afar. You're not so keen on being immediately identified with Jesus. So you keep it kind of low pro. People don't really, they'll find out. You know, they'll, it'll be, it's there. They'll, they'll see at some point. You're following from afar. Pretty soon what happens, because you're not in fellowship, then now you start warming yourself where the enemy warms himself. You're, you're, you're with the enemy. You're in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing. And then what happens after that is it's already happened. Then, then it's, your life's not about Jesus anymore at all. And you're speaking in ways that just, just you know, disprove any validity that you, that you would know him, that you do know him. You're, you're about to deny him. Now, as that diagnosis is so important for us, we want to have that and hold it and say, where am I? Am I, am I letting any of this stuff be part of my life? We, we check ourselves. But you know what's so awesome about this? Is this is when his life changed. It's when, it's when he finally was broken. When he said, you know what? I mean, from this point forward, Peter, Peter's not the best. He said, I'm the worst. <laughs> I'm at the bottom, man. I did what nobody else did. I did it in a way nobody else did it. I need Jesus. From this point forward, the rest of his life, he needs Jesus. Up to this point, Jesus needs him. But after this point, he needs Jesus. I wonder where you are. Does Jesus need you? Or do you, have you come to the point where you say, I need him. <laughs> oh, yeah, I need him. He's got to save me. And what's awesome about this is that he goes out and weeps bitterly. We've got another disciple who's going to weep bitterly, Judas Iscariot. He's going to realize the mistake that he made. He's going to realize how horrible it is. And he, he's, he's grieving. He throws the money down in the temple, and he goes out and kills himself. He, he doesn't repent. You got Peter on the other side where just as deep of a brokenness and, uh, and the Lord is able to, you know, a totally different person and the Lord changes his life. So it's a great chapter and you kind of see how it's sort of, even though it's really about Jesus, we get a very detailed sort of view of Peter's steps towards falling. So Father, help us. Help us to... 
take note of these things and, and not follow in this same example, Lord. May it be a warning to us. Lord, give us grace to avoid these pitfalls that we wouldn't follow from afar. Lord, you know each one of our hearts. I pray that you, by your Spirit, would uh, bring it to mind, Lord, what we need to hear each one of us. Lord, if there's people here, then you're telling them, you need to pray. I told you to pray, and you stopped. Lord, that you'd speak to them. Tell them to pray. Lord, if there's people here that have been making exceptions to the Word of God and saying, I, I don't need it or it doesn't apply, Lord, that you'd speak to them and say, hey, this is your warning. Can you hear the rooster? Come to your senses. Come back now before it's too late. Lord, even for those that, in one sense, we'd say they, that it's too late, they've already fallen. Thank you, Jesus, that even though Peter fell, you were able to lift him up. And that in his brokenness and in his, in his failure, that you are a great Savior. And so, Lord, even draw to yourself those that have fallen. If that's you, I want to encourage you. Open your heart right now and say, Lord, I need you. I need Jesus. You don't need me, but I need you. Just take this second right now and pray and ask him to forgive you. Come back to him. If you've drifted away, come back. If you're following from afar, come back. Just open your heart to him. Even now as we sing, open your heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.